Jesus is worthy. He is worthy of all that we bring to Him, and we bring Him our praise. And now we open our hearts to God's Word. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Kings chapter 18. The title of the message comes right out of our text, a great story in the Bible, one of my favorite in all of Scripture. When the fire fell on Mount Carmel and revival came, spiritual awakening came to Israel. And what happened so long ago, 3,000 years ago, I'm praying that once again the fire would fall. That the fire would bring the light, and with the light, spiritual awakening. These are dark days in many ways for the world and for our beloved nation. America deeply, desperately needs spiritual awakening. Uh, our nation is in a moral freefall. Uh, the spiritual darkness is encroaching all around us. There's no question that the biblical foundations upon which America was built are being destroyed one piece at a time. Sin is destroying the soul of our people. And without spiritual awakening, we will wake up one day to America that we do not know, that could be gone forever. And so God has put it on my heart in these days to pray more daringly, more desperately for spiritual awakening, which begins in me, which begins in you, the church, and that this spiritual awakening would spread across America and bring, sweep millions of people into the kingdom of God, into the family of faith. I have three basic prompts for you from God's Word. This revival can come, this spiritual awakening will happen when we pray, when we stand, and when we speak. So in 1 Kings chapter 18, this is the conclusion of the story. I'm going to take sometimes I get to the end of a book and I read the conclusion before I read the book. So not often, but many of you know this story. It's one of the most well-known stories in the Bible. But it's about a God contest a battle of the gods at a place called Carmel in Israel. In fact, I brought you some footage from uh, Carmel, uh, some video footage. There it is on the plains uh, of Israel and the Judean plains there. There is a statue that's on top of Mount Carmel of what someone thinks Elijah may have looked like. There he is with drawn sword, a powerful prophet of God. There's the Valley of Megiddo for the last world battle. <coughs> will be fought, and that's overlooking or at the outlook of Mount Carmel, where what you're about to read actually took place. There's a couple of would-be prophets, <laughs> Jack and Jarrett, standing at Elijah's feet. Uh, Jarrett preached a great message uh, on top of Mount Carmel, and, you know, we go most every year and love to take you. and stand there with you and experience this. I'm telling you, uh, a trip to the Holy Land is like a front row seat to the Bible. And so in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verses 36 and following, and at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O God. That's a desperate, daring prayer. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that the people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. That's revival. That's awakening when our hearts are turned back to God. Verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, He is God. He is God. The Lord, He is 
God. Now, there are three primary personalities you need to know related to this passage of Scripture and what happened on Mount Carmel that day when the fire fell. Uh, Obviously, Elijah, we'll get to him in just a moment. But there was a king of Israel by the name of Ahab. Now, Ahab is described as the most worthless, despicable king in all of the history of Israel. How would you like that written about you in the Bible? Eternal Word of God. This guy's the biggest loser of all. The worst king in the history of the nation. And one of the reasons that he was the worst king ever for Israel is that he was married to a Gentile woman, a heathen unbeliever by the name of Jezebel. You ever heard of her? Sure, it's common in our culture even to speak of a Jezebel, though you probably would not name your daughter Jezebel. You might name, you wouldn't even name your dog Jezebel. Now, I had a cat when I was a little boy. (laughs) Someone gave us this cat and we adopted it. I don't know what we first named this cat, Kitty, probably something very unique like that. But I, you know, being a very astute biblical little boy, uh, this is about, I was six or seven years old, because this cat was scratching me constantly. It was an evil cat. I renamed her Jezebel. So. Don't hate on me, all you cat lovers, but, uh, you know, you might name your cat Jezebel. I don't know. (laughs) But she was a very evil woman. She was a witchy woman. She was a wicked woman. In fact, she is described as the most wicked woman in all of the Bible. An evil queen married to this loser king, Ahab a powerful seductress who killed, who cut off the prophets of God and led Israel into idolatry and ultimate judgment. She was known for emasculating men and was determined to destroy the spiritual foundations of the nation. That was Jezebel. And though she lived 3,000 years ago, the spirit of Jezebel is alive to this very day. The spirit of Jezebel. In fact, Jesus spoke of the spirit of Jezebel in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20. He said to his church in that day, I have this against you that you tolerate That woman, Jezebel, we don't know if this was a woman actually named Jezebel or it is someone that Jesus or John is describing as Jezebel, a woman in the church who was a false prophetess, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and, here's a key word, seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols, which is demonism. Idolatry, Paul tells us in the New Testament, is linked to demonism. So Jezebel was a demonic woman empowered by Satan and doing the work of evil on earth. And her primary tools, were these were idolatry and the worship of Baal and immorality. The worship of Baal, this is background, the worship of Baal was a very strange and bizarre kind of worship, like the idolatry of the pagan world at that era. But it was a strange mix between idolatry, the worship of idols, false idols, false gods, false religion, and sexual perversion, and infanticide, or the killing of infants. In fact, when you travel to Israel today, this same area where you visit Carmel, there is a, uh, an altar, a Hittite altar, another ancient people who worship false gods. And that altar, history tells us, and historians and archaeologists 
uncovered this thing. But it was an altar where sacrifices took place, including the sacrifices of babies and children. Even to this day, every time I see that place, I get the cold chills to think of what was happening in the sacrifice of these babies. But this was the kind of worship. It, again, was a strange breed, a mix of of idolatry and morality and the sacrifices of children. The spirit of Jezebel. And this spirit is in the world today because Satan's power is still in the world as well. The same demonic forces, again, that empowered Jezebel are at work today. The spirit of Jezebel, it, it, it rides on the massive proliferation of pornography and perversion, sexual perversion in our own culture. It, it, it rides on the killing of babies via abortion and infanticide. 62 million, again, I repeat that number, is so staggering it's hard to comprehend. If you can't comprehend 62 million, think of thousands every day in America. Spirit of Jezebel, in the rise of radical feminism in the world, in our own culture, those who defy God's authority, lesbianism, LBGTQ rights, and all the rest, the rise of radical feminism, and the effort to silence the voices of truth. Jezebel sought to cut off Elijah and all the rest of the prophets of God. And she was effective in doing that. In fact, many of the prophets were hiding in a cave in fear of this woman, Jezebel, the spirit of Jezebel. And there are many preachers, would-be prophets, who are hiding today because of the spirit of Jezebel. Yes, she is alive and well. And she is alive and well in every satanic plot that seeks to destroy the foundations of truth in America and around the world. And just as Jesus said to the church in that era, He is saying to His church today, do not tolerate that woman Jezebel, because a severe judgment awaits her. So Jezebel and Ahab are a corrupt political power ruling over Israel, and they were effective because the prophets were scattering, and they raised up 850 prophets to Baal and Asherah, the companion to Baal. All these prophets and the nation was dying as a result. But then came Elijah. You got to love Elijah. Elijah was an alpha male. He was a big dog. And he was powerful, persuasive, and in fact, he was from a, the country. He was a country boy. We don't even know if his town is named where he was born, but can't even find it on the map. Sort of like Toadsuck Ferry, Arkansas, something like that. And he was a country boy. And, you know, you may think of a prophet as being that statue but, but, uh, of Elijah, but Elijah probably looked a little something like this. I thought I'd bring Elijah's picture uh, to you. This. Uh, you know, if Elijah was around today, he'd probably drive a pickup truck and have a gun rack. Yeah, an alpha male, strong. And yet, James tells us, you know, he's a superhero kind of character in the Scripture. But yet, James tells us that this man was a man of like passions and weaknesses that we all have. In other words, he was an ordinary guy in so many ways, just like all the rest of us. Do not think that God can only use, quote, superheroes or great mighty prophets of God. He was a man, a person just like the rest of us that God used in a powerful way because he did three things. And these are the three prompts that I want to give you because this is what will bring revival to your life, to your home, to your family, to our church, to our nation as we pray. Number one is to pray. Because we're told that Elijah was a man 
of prayer who courageously therefore stood up and spoke up to his generation. This prayer that he offers. In fact, again, I quote James on a biography of, of Elijah, verses 17 and 18. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed, watch this, fervently, and I might add fearlessly, that it might not rain. And for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave faith, uh, gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So when Elijah prayed, God moved in response to his prayer. His private prayer as well as his public prayer. Before he prayed on Mount Carmel for the fire to fall, he spent three years at a place called Kareth, a brook in the middle of nowhere, isolated. And yet God taught him some things about his power and his miracles there at the brook Kareth as he prayed privately and Carmel and the victory of Carmel would have never happened apart of Kareth. And what happened there? He prayed. The Bible says he prayed fervently or earnestly. So much of our praying, dear church, dear people, is soft and weak and half-hearted. When this man prayed, what set him apart was that he prayed fervently and therefore powerfully. powerfully. And if we're going to see the fire fall in our generation. It's going to take daring and desperate prayer. To pray with heart. Stephen Alford wrote a book that I read as a young Christian that always captivated my, my attention on revival. He called it Heart Cry for Revival. Do our hearts cry out to God? So often in the Scripture, the prayer that brings the fire, the awakening, the light, is described as crying out to God. Are we crying out to Him? Our prayers need to be intentional and intense. We can't play at prayer because prayer, this kind of praying, is warfare praying, and it's a spiritual battle. The battle that takes place on Mount Carmel between the prophets of Baal and the prophet of God, Elijah, was a spiritual battle between the forces of God and the forces of Satan, between light and darkness. And this is the battle we face in our world and our nation today. It is a spiritual battle. And so we pray and fight this battle on our knees. Secondly. The second prompt is stand. Clearly, Elijah was a man who was courageous. When I speak of standing, that's what I'm talking about. In the face of evil, that we would stand boldly, bravely, not arrogantly, not brashly, but bravely and boldly. Unfortunately, many don't want to stand in a generation that is in opposition to what we believe about the Bible. I mean, this is not a, this is not a politically correct culture. If you stand for the authority and the inerrancy of Scripture, the infallibility of God's Word, You're considered fringe, a freak, and no one wants to to be considered a freak. We don't want to stand out. There are many preachers that won't take a stand for God's Word. If you stand for Christ, that He is the way, the truth, and the life as He claimed, the only way to the Father, you'll stand out from the crowd. If you stand for truth and righteousness and authority of God's Word, that there is morality according to the Scripture, then you'll be considered a standoff and you'll be put aside as someone who 
who's a freak, a fool. So a lot of people just don't have the courage to stand. And again, I'm talking about a lot of preachers, unfortunately. I'm asking you to take a stand for Christ. First Kings 17.1 tells us how he stood. He stood in the presence of God before he stood in the presence of King. He said to the King, I stand in the presence of God. And it's more than trite to say that if you can stand before God, you can stand before any man. One plus one with God is a majority. So you can stand. But unfortunately, too many people want to blend in. We want to blend in with the crowd at our offices, in the locker room, the classroom. We want to blend in rather than to stand out. You don't want to come across as a freak. So, what we need today is courage. Don't compromise on your morals. Don't compromise on your mentality, on your faith, just to be accepted by the crowd. Be bold. Be courageous. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. After all, we have stood before God. We are people of the resurrection. The power of God's Spirit resides in us. And even if we must stand alone, if we're the only ones standing, you know, Elijah, at one point in his life, even after this great victory on Carmel, ran for his life afraid of Jezebel because he was so depressed. He thought he was the only one. He was isolated. He thought he was the only one standing for God. He wasn't. But he felt alone. And I know sometimes you may feel alone in your own family, in your own home, in your own neighborhood, in your own workplace. But you are not alone. And this is why it is so important as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that we do stand together, united in Christ. That no one would stand alone. That we would be together and triumphant. So Elijah took this stand. And the king challenged him to a contest. He said, all right, let's, let's see whose God is God. We'll build altars on Mount Carmel, one to Baal and another to your God, Jehovah God, Yahweh God. And the God who answers by fire, the God who sends fire upon the altar will be God. Elijah said, I'll take that. And so Elijah along with the 450 prophets of Baal that were there that day. They go to Mount Carmel, and, uh, and Elijah defers on the kickoff and lets them go first. And so the prophets of Baal, they begin to cry out to their God, their false God, their fraudulent, phony, fake God. And nothing's happening, of course. They're screaming, they're shouting. This is also typical of crazy idol worship. If you've seen witchcraft practice in some way, think in these terms, and they're shouting and they're screaming and nothing is happening. And along the way, it goes on all morning. And along the way, Elijah does a little trash talking. He starts talking some smack. He says, where is your God? He said, maybe he's on a vacation. It's all in the Bible, you can read it. He said, maybe he's gone on a long trip or maybe he's out to dinner. Or maybe he's taking a break, a bathroom break. It's all right there. And, and, and that just en enraged them all the more. And now they begin to cut themselves and they're bleeding and they're shouting and they're screaming. And all day long it goes on and, and nothing happens because Baal is no God at all. And so Elijah takes his turn. And that's where we read the scripture and he just prayed that God would send the fire for God's glory. If you want revival for yourself so you'll feel better, that's the wrong motivation. The revival, the awakening is for, not even for America, but it is for the glory of God. The glory of God. So he prays for the glory of God. 
that God is worthy of this, and, and he prays, and God sends the fire. Now, this is after Elijah fills up the trough around the altar. He lines up uh, the stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel, showing the unity uh, of Israel at this point, to speak of their spiritual heritage around the altar. He pours water, three barrels fulls of water all over the altar, as someone said, just to prove that any God that can't burn wet wood is no God at all. Uh, Elijah wanted to make sure that, the, that, the, uh, that everyone knew that this was not going to be some spontaneous combustion, some accident of science that took place, but rather that everyone would know because this altar is now soaked and saturated. And so when the fire fell, everyone would know this is God. And that's exactly what happened. It went nuclear that day and that altar exploded. And when it did, and when the fire fell, that's when the people fell on their faces and worshiped God. In the midst of that, in the heart of all of this, Elijah said to the people, how long, how long will you go limping, hesitating between two opinions? If God is God, serve Him. If Baal is God, then serve Baal. It's a big if. But He said to the people of God, you're not only to stand up, but you're to speak up and serve God. So, He said, whose side are you on? And that's the question for our generation. In a world with a Jezebel spirit all around us, with a culture of death all around us, with the collapse of our biblical foundations. What the question that every one of us need to hear is the question that Elijah asked the people so long ago, how long will you go hesitating, limping, staggering like an intoxicated individual? How long will you go on like this straddling a fence Refusing to make up your mind, he's saying, do it now, make a decision. Heard about three frogs that were sitting on a log. Two of the frogs decided to jump in the water. So how many frogs were left on the log? One? No, three. Because to decide to jump in the water is not jumping in the water. That was a trick question. I apologize. So when are you going to decide and then do something about it? We have too many fence straddlers and compromisers to have revival in the church. And in order that God would move among His people, that the fire would fall, awakening us, then we're going to have to get off the fence. Stop straddling. Make up your mind. It's the same thing that Joshua said to the people of Israel, choose you this day whom you will serve. It's what Jesus said when He said, you're either for me or against me. You choose. So what Elijah is saying, I'm saying today to all of us, how long are you going to keep walking the line, staggering along the way, instead of making up your mind and going all in? Because until we do, we won't see the power of God fall upon our lives, our family, our churches. This is a call to consecration and commitment to make a choice and then to act in obedience to God. That's what happened that day. There was prayer, there was standing, and then there was speaking for the glory of God. That we speak out for life, that we speak up for truth, that we speak in to the lives of people God's Word. That's the revival we need. It's what I'm praying for. I'm, I'm 69 years old. 
I'll be 70 June the 30th. I actually tell people I've already turned 70 because if you believe what we believe about conception, well, I'm 70 years old right now. So I kind of like it. I made my three score and 10. But I tell you that to say, I pray in my lifetime to see it, to experience it, to see God just move powerfully. We've seen glimpses. There have been sprinkles, but oh, for the showers we plead. Oh, for the fire to fall so that our families and our children, our children's children would live in the glow of God, in the glory of God that comes upon us in our generation. I'm praying, oh God, just one more time, one more time, let us see it. Let us see your glory and your fire fall.